American history. The names of generals and places reverberate through history as a reminder that a house divided against itself cannot stand. I'm Scott Wilkins here in Sanderson, Florida, at the location of Florida's largest Civil War battle, located just 50 miles west of Jacksonville. It is often overlooked not only for its place, but its time in the war itself. There are many causes that eventually led to war, but it wasn't until the election of Abraham Lincoln on November 6th, 1860, that the scales were tipped. South Carolina, having threatened to secede once before in 1832 during the nullification crisis, finally achieved its goal via unanimous vote on December 20th. Mississippi followed on January 9th, 1861, and the following day, by a vote of 62 to 7, Florida had left the United States. Following close behind Florida were Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. On February 4th, the seven states of the Deep South formed the Confederate States of America with its capital, Montgomery, Alabama. The United States, however, was still maintaining a military presence at a handful of forts along the coast, including Fort Pickens in Pensacola and Fort Sumter in Charleston. History could have unfolded differently with Fort Pickens trying to be resupplied at the same time as Fort Sumter. As it happened on April 12th, the guns surrounding Charleston Harbor opened fire on Fort Sumter, and the following day, despite suffering zero casualties from enemy fire, the garrison surrendered and the American Civil War had officially begun. Four days after Fort Sumter surrendered, Virginia, Arkansas, North Carolina, and Tennessee all voted to secede from the Union. This would place the Confederate capital in Richmond, Virginia, where fully 16,000 Floridians would go to fight on for the Confederacy and another 2,000 fighting for the Union. It only underscored how divided the states truly were. As the war progressed, many of these Florida regiments saw action in many of the major campaigns, including Antietam, Vicksburg, Gettysburg, and Atlanta. The importance of Florida increased in 1863 when Vicksburg fell to Union forces under General Ulysses S. Grant, and it became the major source of beef and leather to the Confederacy. Despite a growing blockade, it was still also a major producer of salt. The noose, however, was tightening, and the time was running out by the time General Sherman started making his famous March to the Sea. Hearing word of Union sympathizers in Florida, the Lincoln administration wanted to establish a pro-Union government ahead of the 1864 election, which would see the president go against his former top general, George B. McClellan. To accomplish this goal, General Quincy Gilmore, commander of the Union's Department of the South, sent Brigadier General Truman Seymour to occupy Jacksonville and to destroy vital resources for the South by raiding west into Lake City and Gainesville. This is the Florida Atlantic and Gulf Central Railroad, the main artery in North Florida. Running parallel to it is Jacksonville Road. This is the main route the Union Army was marching in a slow, methodical march to Lake City in three columns. As they stopped here for lunch, a woman proclaimed, you'll go back quicker than you came. They had no idea how right she would be. Commanding the Confederate forces in Florida was General Joseph Finnegan. Knowing the Union Army would be coming his way, he decided to establish a line in one of the few defensible locations at Olusty Station. Here, the railroad passed through a narrow corridor of dry ground bordered by impassable swamps to the south and a large body of water known as Ocean Pond to the north. Finnegan would be undermanned with only 500 soldiers, but with reinforcements streaming in on both sides, eventually both would put forth 5,000 men. On the morning of February 20th, General Finnegan sent forward the 64th Georgia Regiment to discover how close the Union forces were. They began skirmishing with pickets of the 7th Connecticut Volunteers. Both sides exchanged cannon fire as reinforcements were brought forth to form lines of battle. Joining the 7th Connecticut were the 48th New York Volunteers and the 35th United States Color Troops. The Confederate forces were reinforced by General Alfred Colquitt, who brought up the 6th, 28th, and 19th Georgia Regiments. What started as a small skirmish soon gave way to a full-fledged battle as reinforcements continued to stream in on both sides. After several hours of fighting, the Union Army attempted to roll up the Confederate left from their right. Here I am standing on a Union right where the tide of battle would soon begin to change. Colonel Hawley, who was repositioning the 7th New Hampshire, gave a wrong command which resulted in the unit retreating to the rear. This left the 8th U.S. Colored Troops, a largely untrained unit, in position to fight the Confederates. They suffered 300 casualties before they eventually retreated to the rear as well. General Colquitt, commanding Confederate forces in the field, ordered his forces to advance along a front stretching a mile long, north to south. Confederate forces pushed forward, including the last of the reserves, the 6th Florida Battalion, the 1st, 23rd, 27th, and 32nd Georgia Regiments, as well as Chatham's artillery. To stop this advance, General Seymour ordered Colonel William Barton's brigade 
the 47th, 48th, and 115th New York forward. The Union line was stabilized, but General Finnegan had arrived on the scene with the last of his reserves, the 1st Florida Battalion and Bonard's Battalion. General Seymour began to realize the battle was lost and sent Colonel James Montgomery's brigade, consisting of the 35th U.S. Colored Troops and the 54th Massachusetts, to cover the retreat. The Union Army would retreat back to Jacksonville, having suffered 203 men killed, 1,152 men wounded, and 506 missing, to 93 men killed, 847 wounded, and 6 missing. The 34% casualty rate was the highest in the war, with so few men engaged. While it was a Confederate victory, the man with the coolest name in history, General Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard, commented to Confederate President Jefferson Davis that the result of the fighting was insignificant because his forces had not made an attempt to pursue the fleeing Union troops. The immediate result of the battle was that Florida would remain a Confederate state for the remainder of the war, and the Union Army would barely venture outside of Jacksonville. Of course, it didn't matter too much because Lincoln would still go on to win re-election in a landslide over McClellan. The importance of the battle, however, was that it was one of the few major engagements of the Civil War in which black soldiers would play a large role. One such unit, the 54th Massachusetts, would eventually be immortalized in the 1989 film Glory, directed by Edward Zwick and starring Denzel Washington, Matthew Broderick, Morgan Freeman, Andre Brower, and Carrie Ewells. While the film does not feature the Battle of Velocity, some scenes were shot at its location. In 1909, 45 years after the battle, three acres of land were acquired by the state of Florida to commemorate the event. And on October 23, 1912, veterans of the battle gathered with Florida Governor Albert W. Gilchrist to dedicate the monument. Finally, in 1949, it officially became registered as a Florida State Park.